Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cope Life podcast interview series. I'm so excited to be here. This is where I bring you stories, really incredible stories of people who have experienced really trauma and tragedy that I have not. And then they inspire us with how they've overcome. And I can tell you that today's guest is no different. Her story is inspiring. I actually first heard about her from other people. Other people telling me she's amazing. She has a great story. You need to connect with her. And so I did, you know, because I trust my friends. That's how we roll. And so she's here. Without further ado, I want to introduce you to B. Mora. And just let's get started. Tell us about okay. yourself. Okay. Hello. Um, I'm biased, but your friends are very trustworthy. Um, <laughs> so uh, I am an Air Force veteran. I was in the Air Force from 2008 to 2018. Um, I kind of have a story that goes all over the place because I was um, an English instructor for high school and college before I did that. Um, went through graduate school and um was working overseas as a teacher on a Fulbright grant and then came back and I was about 26 when I joined the Air Force. So I was a little older. I joined as an Arabic language analyst um, and I did that for the 10 years. I got out, um, began working at NASA, uh, did that for a year, still trying to get off this planet whenever they give me a ride, but we'll see. Um, and I went back as a government civilian uh, as a language analyst where I'm at now. So I went back as an Arabic language analyst to the government. Um, but last year I was put back in language class to learn Russian. So I am now technically a Russian language analyst. And I have also been um, a victim advocate for sexual assault and domestic violence for about 20 years since I was about 18. Um, I began that uh, working at Amnesty International, actually as a human rights activist and a, st a state death penalty abolition coordinator for Illinois. Um, I am all but dissertation for my doctorate in language, culture, and literacy education, if I ever get the writing done, which is a work in progress. <laughs> um, and I'm an avid skydiver when I can find time and the weather is cooperative. So that is that is me in a nutshell. I've just done everything. I'm trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up, pretty much. Wow. Well, <laughs> if, you said, if you said you wanted to be amazing when you grow up, I'd say you're there. <laughs> well, all so, right. I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> all right. All right. Yeah. So so let me summarize because you just said a lot. So you are a you are a Russian and Arabic speaking school teacher who worked at NASA and jumps out of planes and advocates for human rights. Yes, that is, That's that a is lot. yes. I'm going to like have to write that down and use that on my resume now, my little blur resume. Yes, that is pretty much it. <laughs> and so really every aspect, I mean, you had, of course, a job that you did in the military. We follow orders, right? Mm -hmm. But beyond that, everything that you've done, maybe except for jumping out of perfectly fine airplanes, everything else... <laughs> There's no such thing. They're death traps. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna come back to that in a okay. second. Okay. Uh, every everything else that you've done was in service of other people. Mm -hmm. Whether it's teaching people or advocating for them, Amnesty International, sexual assault, domestic violence, human rights, um, just all of it is mm -hmm. is in service of other people. And that's that's what I love about you is that when someone tells me, when a great person tells me that you're a great person, well, I believe them, you know. Um, but when it comes to jumping out of airplanes, I'll say that you said that you wanted to get off this planet as fast as you can. But when you jump out of airplane, you actually came to the planet as fast as possible. I make it back every time. Yeah, <laughs> it's... <laughs> It's, you know, a little disheartening, um, but it's actually, it, you know what, it's actually really great because I, the skydiving community reminds me a lot of the military community in that um, you, we, you have that companionship with people, whether you know them or not. Um, so, you know, we can meet other veterans from other places and we just have that kinship with them that they're veterans. And it's the same with skydivers, but skydivers also actually, we do um, a whole bunch of charity events throughout the year. 
um, where we raise money for different charities. And I think besides just really loving <laughs> jumping out of planes for whatever reason, um, I uh, because I'm actually terrified of heights. Um, so figure that one out. Um, but I do love it. And we do give back a lot. So I um, think that I'm drawn to it because of that, because we can do something that we all enjoy that's incredibly fun um, while also raising money for charity. So I love it. I love it. It's it's I mean, you said that I mean, that you started in this work of serving people at the age of 18. Yes. And you're still, and you're still doing it now. And I love it. That's I mean, we talk about consistency. That's really what consistency is. Right. That's that's your life. For, even the, the most thrilling, the most exciting thing that you do is tied to helping others. So I love that. Yeah. But at the Thank same you. time, you have a story that maybe would have broken some people and moved them away from helping others. Hmm. Um, yeah. Yet you persevered. So what I, what I want to dig into is, um, and for those of people seeing this or people that have seen my, my podcast before, you know, we just jump right in. <laughs> and so just, just come with the truth. Tell us yeah. your story. I, I want, I want to be able to feel I want to be able to relate to the emotion. I don't think I, I don't know if I can handle what you've handled, but <laughs> sure. Let's, let's dig in. Tell us your you. story. Sure. Um, so my story, um, I would say uh, an important part of it begins when I was about 10. So I was um, a victim of child sexual abuse um, by a neighbor. And really, um, you know, I think that in my life of really reflecting on things and working on myself, that's where a lot of my issues started. Um, and it wasn't actually because of the act itself, which was very upsetting. And I'll, you know, kind of go into um, the problems I had a little further, maybe, but the response was the issue. So I told people, um, you know, it took me a while to speak out about it because really, at, you know, nine or 10 years old, you don't have the vocabulary to really say what's going on. Sometimes you, you kind of know it's wrong, but you don't know, um, you don't know how to vocalize that. And, you know, it was a different time. Um, it was in the early nineties. And so there wasn't a whole lot done about it. It was a kind of, you know, um, we'll acknowledge it, but kind of just don't talk about it. Don't, don't go over there anymore and like we'll leave it and um so that same year um there was another instance of sexual abuse with a nurse a male nurse um at my elementary school and that i i didn't mention to anybody and i will say that that kind of started this this stepping stone right of well if you tell somebody something as a child and nothing's done about it why would you bring it up if it happens again? Um, because that just, you know, that's how your kind of mind works. And I think our mind works like that as adults too. Um, and fast forward um, a couple years, well, more than a couple years, a couple decades, <laughs> um, I was married um, to a man who was perfect um, in the beginning. Um, as is always the story. And then after we got married, there was your kind of classic abuse of um, we're going to start with like little things that push the line, little comments or little messages um, that are, are very negative or things that are, you know, lightly verbally abusive. And we're going to keep pushing that line until we see where it goes. Um, it got to the point where it was physical, sexual, and verbally and emotionally and mentally abusive, just every way you can possibly think about it. Um, and again, um, I initially spoke up and was saying, hey, this is happening, what's going on? And I got the same kind of responses of, um, well, you know, maybe he's, you know, yelling at you or saying these things because you're difficult to talk to you know, or maybe this is happening, you know, um, 
I remember telling, you know, finally coming out and telling some extended family members and it's like, oh, you guys will get through this. You'll be okay. And this kind of response, you know, is when you're in an abusive relationship, you are dealing with daily gaslighting anyway. And so when this is the response you get from people, it makes you question yourself even more. Like, well, maybe it's not that bad. Maybe I'm the problem here. Um, and it really culminated. I went on a deployment. Um, the abuse, uh, at least verbally and emotionally, continued throughout the deployment for about a year. Um, I came back. And very shortly after I came back from deployment, there was a particular instance um, that kind of, you know, defining moment that blew everything up. Um, he, my husband at the time, he pulled a knife on me and within maybe, um, I got away from that within maybe 11 or 12 hours of that. Um, I was trying to figure out what to do. Um, and I was going back on midnights at work. I had all this stuff going on. I hadn't really processed deployment yet. Um, and I was in my room, um, door locked <laughs> because the incident had just happened, um, trying to sleep, trying to figure out what was going on. I hadn't slept in about probably 48 hours at that time. Um, heard some commotion going on and walked out of my bedroom, um, went to his room where he was at. He, he had like an office, um, went to his office and he had hung himself. Um, I was able at that time to get him down in time. And I will say that um, from that point, it was a systemic failure. It wasn't a failure of one person. Um, my unit responded, my military unit responded, didn't really know what to do. Um, the police officer that responded um, spent a pretty good time, amount of time questioning me um, as to whether he actually tried to commit suicide or whether I tried to hurt him um, myself. Um, and then everybody was rightly concerned about the knife incident that had kind of happened the night before, because this was early morning. Um, and so everybody was kind of angry at me for not mentioning that. And really, it wasn't um, on purpose I didn't mention that. But at that time, um, the suicide attempt was kind of my primary focus, especially as an advocate. Like, is he okay? Does he need medical treatment? Obviously, he's going to need medical treatment. So I had paramedics and, um, you know, sergeants and um, police officers saying, well, we're mandatory reporters and you have to tell us and, you know, what happened. Um, so I did, I did fill out um, a report with the police officer. And I remember specifically saying, um, can you mention that the incident that took place last night, that it did involve a weapon and it was violent because if anything happens to me, I need this on record. Um, he assured me it was okay. He eventually gave me a card um, for a, a domestic violence shelter in the area that I didn't know about. Um, and we went to the hospital. Um, the hospital, um, at the time was a little bit unhelpful. They were on the base and they did not, their mental health floor did not take civilians, which I had no idea. Um, my sergeants, um, you know, and I, I want to preface this by saying everybody in these scenarios, I believe was doing the best they can. I don't believe they were being malicious. I think they just had a lack of knowledge and experience on what to do. Um, but the people from my military unit left, um, left me alone with him. And the hospital at the time um, decided, this was hours, hours later, that a social worker showed up. And, you know, remember, I have not slept now in almost three days. Um, he said, oh, okay, well, I'm, I talked to some people and I'm looking at paperwork and I don't see a history of violent behavior. So if you think about it, um, with paramedics, a police officer, at least three sergeants, nobody mentioned this to medical staff. You know, everybody who was a mandatory reporter who was so concerned about this, nobody, nobody decided to mention this to medical staff. So I just blew it off. I was like, yeah, you're right. When do, when do I get out of here? Like, when do I get to go home? Um, because in my experience in the military, um, for those of us, you know, who were in the military, 
you get a 72 hour hold for even having ideations, let alone a very valid suicide attempt. Um, the social worker said that he, he did me a favor <laughs> um, by convincing the ER staff to keep my husband overnight for observation there at the ER, but that um, Georgia, where we were at the time, did uh, no longer require a 72 hour hold and that he did not think that he qualified for one. So they were not going to hold him for a psyche eval. Um, and they actually, which I understand now is illegal, I did not at that time, they appointed me his suicide watch and made me stay in the room with him um, for the night to make sure he was okay. Um, and they released him to me the next day. Um, so that was a lot. And so when I say that, I, I say that it wasn't one person that failed. It was many, many people that failed, um, in protecting me. And so when I look at so many of these, um, of these instances and, you know, my last assignment, I, I was able to move out of that situation. I got out of the situation, um, was able to PCS to another location, file for divorce. Um, I also had um, instances where my direct supervisor was found guilty of reprisal um, and discrimination against me. And I was just tired um, because nobody had done anything about that either. <laughs> and I think what's important to remember is that people say, um, well, why didn't you call the police, right? Why didn't you say anything? And what I try to emphasize to people is the importance that we have of our response to victims. Because at a very young age, if I tell somebody or I tell a school resource officer or, you know, I tell somebody who's close to me, who's in law enforcement and nothing happens. And then I go on later in my life and I report it to police officers, which actually the police officer um, who took my report about him pulling a knife on me, the only sentence he had in there um, other than the suicide was they had a, a fight the night before. No details about what happened. Um, and so what people don't understand is that um, in my mind, like I think of it as a computer, right? When you're in trauma response, you're on safe mode and only the minimum tabs you need are open. And in my life, I hadn't, law enforcement never showed me that it was somebody who would help me. It had already kind of been ingrained in that foundation that they are not who you call. Even though as a victim advocate, I always tell people to call law enforcement. For me, in a trauma situation, that's not who I thought to call. I thought to call my best friend who had always been there when I needed her to help me. Um, and she validated that by like setting everything in motion, saying, you take care of what you need to. I'm going to call everybody else. Um, and so I think we don't understand how, especially with children, um, that response doesn't just stay with them, but it shapes who they are. It shapes their foundation. It shapes the way they think about not only other people, but themselves. Um, I have not, I mean, I continue to struggle, but really struggled with feeling like um, I just had no value and I didn't matter because every time I spoke up about something, it seemed that people didn't care or that it was, somehow a result of something I did or didn't do. And I don't think, you know, we realize um, how really devastating that is for children um, who have just all kinds of different ways of letting us know something is wrong. You know, I know that I have heard hundreds of times and I know that I've heard from me personally, you know, oh, like you were such an angry kid, like you had such a temper, like you had such a problem with anger or, you know, this kid is really sad all the time. You know, God, I don't know what's wrong with my son or daughter. And we are labeling them, um, especially as children and not thinking, well, what part did we play in that? You know, do we have a hand in why they're so angry or why they're so sad instead of looking at um, the why 
you know, okay, my kid has these angry outbursts or these, you know, bouts of just crying or depression. Um, and instead of being angry at them about it, really thinking, what have we, um, whether it's as a teacher, as a, as a caretaker, as a parent, as an aunt, whoever, what have we not done? you know, or what are we missing here um, that is causing these behaviors and these responses? And I think you get to a point where um, you're an adult and now you have to deal with these things. Um, and I, you know, read something actually today that says, you know, most people, which I, I believe actually, most people are in therapy, um, because of other people in their lives who actually needed the therapy. And I'm like, yes, that, that is true. You know, you, you have to break the cycle, um, somehow. So it was, um, it was a lot, it was a lot to deal with. It was a lot to try to get through. Um, it was a lot of really wondering how, you know, where do I start? What do I do? Um, and it's, it's ongoing, um, but it's, it's definitely been a journey. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's been a lot. <laughs> yeah. I, wow. I mean, you know, parts of what you said kind of, kind of upset me, make me angry. Same. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> like the, the, the main what question I want to ask a lot of these people is mm -hmm. like, really dude? Like really seriously, <laughs> same. <laughs> that has been, um, you know, it's so funny because that has been just kind of this, you know, background question, <laughs> like <laughs> that I want to put like the the thought bubble, like really, <laughs> like, what are we doing here? <laughs> is that is that the best you can do? Mm -hmm. You know, wow. You know, I, I think about, you know, when you were talking about how. We impact children, and, and I've told so many people this, right? But I believe that what we all want for our kids is you want them to feel safe and secure and have a healthy love for themselves, right? Healthy mm -hmm. love, not being narcissistic or anything, but a like healthy love. Like, mm -hmm. I love myself. I have value. And I think that one of the main, to me, the secret weapon to making that happen is hugging your kids and telling them you love them. Like, just start there. And then you can build from there. Um, what I'm wondering with you is you talk about um, the sexual assault by a neighbor when you're 10 years old, and then mm -hmm. a few months later by an authority figure in the school, because when you're in elementary school, all adults are authority figures. Yeah, absolutely. Um, from, from the custodian to the principal, they're all authority figures. Um, so from prior to the first sexual assault, until after the second one, that, that whole time period. Can you talk about how your sense of self-worth changed during that time, during that period? Um, you know, I didn't notice, I think, until much later in my life, how much my self-worth was impacted by that. Um, but I definitely noticed that um, I just felt like... I had a lot of feelings of what did I do to deserve that? And if nothing's being done about it, was it that big of a deal? You know, like I felt like it was a big deal, but maybe it wasn't, you know, I'm a kid and I have to trust the adults around me. So I really started to feel um, not great about myself. Um, and, you know, thinking there must be something wrong with me because maybe this didn't happen to other people. Um, obviously, at that age, you don't know. And now that I'm older, I know that um, the likelihood that it happened to other kids in the neighborhood is is pretty good. Um, but at the time, I didn't know. And, you know, it's funny because I we kind of still joke around about like when we were younger and in I don't know, maybe middle school, because this happened my fifth grade year. And it was always like, God, you know, you guys have always worn such baggy clothes. Um, but into my adulthood, like even into now, you know, with my, my sweatshirt, I never wear um, form fitting clothes. And I never have. And I think that really, really ties back to that, that people giving me um, 
attention around my body made me very, very uncomfortable um, and made me feel like I was opening the door to this kind of thing happening to me. Um, and so, you know, I used to run around in like my little tie dye jumpers or something like in the summer, my little shorts. I can't remember the last time I wore shorts. Um, I don't think I, I mean, I, I don't own any. So, I mean, it, it must've been when I was a kid, but um, yeah, like these little insidious things that you do unconsciously um, that you don't realize until either somebody mentions them to you or you just reflect on how, I wonder why I do that. Um, and so I think it very much set the foundation for um, for self-worth. And I think I've always struggled with it since then. Wow, that's it's interesting when you when you talk about just the clothes that you wear, because when you say that, I think about how how our brain works, right? And there's certain parts mm -hmm. of our brain where we just categorize something as you know, friendly or foe? Is this a mm -hmm. threat or, or is this healthy? Absolutely. And what happens is your your body is informing your brain, mm -hmm. right? So, so logically you can say anyone can wear shorts. People do it all the time. It's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. But your body responds, someone is looking at us. Mm -hmm. We remember what happened when we got too much attention. Absolutely. And so, and so it's your it's your body trying to protect you almost subconsciously. It and then, really. Yeah, it really is. And, and then as you get older. And the self-awareness like you were speaking of is just you get older and you think, OK, this is just how I am. I'm comfortable this way. Mm -hmm. and, and that goes back to what you were saying about how what happens in childhood shapes shapes you as an adult, your self-worth, your, your, the way you perceive yourself, the way that you live. And, and so mm -hmm. what I'm wondering is, so you experienced all that. Mm -hmm. Years passed before you got married. Mm -hmm. And then when you got married, you said he was perfect in the beginning. Did you ever look back and think, or, or did you ever look back and say, look, there were red flags. I just missed them. You know, um, I, I tried and I think that really um, because the divorce was final in 2016 and I'll be honest in saying that it still affects the way I view relationships because he was incredibly sociopathic. And so there, there were no red flags until after we were married and then it was just kind of me being like, well, maybe he was just angry that day, you know, until they started um, compounding. And I think that really hurt not only my sense of trust in myself to read other people, but my sense of trust in just other people. Like how, um, because I remember when I tried to, um, tell people, you know, tell people, Hey, like he's cursing at me. He's doing this. He's doing that. And they're like, no, he doesn't do that. Not, not the him that I know, like he doesn't do that. And I'm thinking like, what, what am I lying? <laughs> like, you know, and it really did take me sending these like black and white messages and forwarding them to people and then being like, this is a totally different person than I know. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just like, yes, yes, it is. And this is what I'm trying to tell you. And so that was my first experience with somebody who was that skilled of a sociopath um, and just could turn it off and on like nothing. Um, and I, you know, I even remember after his suicide attempt, he had to walk out of the house to the um, ambulance. And I mean, this is, he was very close to completing his suicide. Um, and he had like taken a shower and he was laughing and he was like joking with people. And I remember, you know, the paramedics and um, the cop being like, there's no way we would think that he just tried to commit suicide. And I'm just like, well, yes, because this is what I deal with. You know, the switch flips on and then it's off and it's like it never happened. Um, and then I have to deal with my own credibility being questioned. And so, um, yeah, it was, I've always during advocacy saw red flags in people. 
And it was the first time that I realized people could be just completely different from one day to the next. Um, and it has stayed with me. And so, yeah, I, I kind of question everybody I meet now, you know, are they like, they're the best person ever, but you know, I'm going to see them on a forensic files documentary soon or something like that, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. yeah, it really, it really destroys your trust in yourself and other people. Well, thank you so much for answering that question, mm -hmm. because what I was thinking was just the idea of the way so many of us are victimized and it could be it could be small things right not even mm -hmm. abuse it could be someone you know getting five dollars out of you but yes but the way that we blame ourselves and for you to make it clear here on this podcast that it's not your fault if you're the victim no. why why do you not see red flags in the beginning of the relationship um because you're in love like that's mm -hmm. that's the reason and so for you to just say, I didn't see them because that's real mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. That's real life. That's what happens. And then yeah. as you talk about going through the process and people not believing you, you remind me of what we always say, especially during April, right? It's April 15th. April yep. is sexual assaults, awareness and prevention month. And what do we always say? Believe the victim. Yeah. But do we not apply that to verbal abuse? ever no um i don't i actually don't even know that we apply it all the time to physical you know um abuse unfortunately and you know i know in my own experience that is what i've had the hardest time with is people believing me and you know the thing to me that's important to remember is that if somebody decides not to tell you parts of their story you know somebody could come up to me and say, I was sexually assaulted by this person, or this person was inappropriate towards me or said inappropriate things. I don't need details to believe them. Right. I believe them until I am given a reason not to. Um, but they're telling me this for a reason. And I'm never going to tell them, you know, well, you know, if you would just tell me more, or if you would just give me specifics, because that's not my business. At the end of the day, they're coming and trusting me enough to say, you know, this happened to me and it has affected me and I'm going to believe them. But we see it even in, um, you know, the media where it is just immediately you are questioning the character of the victims themselves. Um, and it is just all over, you know, if you look in songs, if you look in movies, if you look in TV shows, if you look at the news, it's just kind of this inundation that people have, um, not only to question victims, but if you're a victim yourself, well, I'm not going to be believed, you know, or I'm going to have my entire past dragged through the mud. Um, and I think that even, you know, my experience with not only believing people, um, but with mental health in general, because obviously all of this has affected my mental health, is that unless it kind of ties up in this nice, neat little package, we want nothing to do with it. Um, and, in, you know, if we can't hashtag it on social media, it's not really something that we're interested in. And it's it's unfortunate because I feel like it's still an uphill battle um, at a time when it shouldn't be an uphill battle still. Yeah, you say at a time it shouldn't be an uphill battle. And there are times where I just ask the question, right? It's 2022. Why is this still an issue? Have we never thought of this before? <laughs> right? Yeah. And, um, yeah. So one thing I, I was I don't thinking know. of, when you talk about going through this process with your, you know, just with your unit, being active duty mm -hmm. military, one thing that I've seen a, a lot, you know, during my time on active duty was the first thing that people want to do is comply with the rules to say that they can do their, they did their job. And then the connection, the empathy, the ensuring that you feel safe, that's secondary. Mm -hmm. that, that, that comes after the checklist. And it just sounds kind of like that's what you dealt with. And, and a lot of times what happens mm -hmm. is going through the checklist can be stressful. 
So, okay, mm -hmm. I've checked this box, I've checked this box, I've done this because this is my job, this is my role. So then they never get around to the part of, did I actually listen to her? Did I do what she asked? Did I know mm -hmm. that she supported? What do you think about that? Yeah, um, I think, you know, I remember being very upset um, because you know, in the military, we always have these um, PowerPoint presentations, right? And and the warning we always get is if somebody is, um, uh, you know, this great soldier, this great airman, and then they come in the next day and they're like, over the next few weeks, they're not brushing their hair, you know, they're just like completely apathetic about their job. And it's like, well, these are the signs. And I mean, I was that PowerPoint. Like I went from being this, you know, I had volunteered for deployment. I ended up being this like great airman. And then I just didn't care anymore. I didn't care about how I looked. I didn't care about my job. I was angry. And it was so held against me. You know, um, it was like, you need to get your shit together. You know, you're not coming in when you're supposed to. And then I remember, um, you know, a few months after that, I was telling somebody I was really, really angry and um, it made it to like one of our, our deputy commanders or something. And she's like, well, I just talked to her a few months ago. Like, what's wrong? And it's like, because this doesn't, this doesn't resolve over a few months. You know, this is trauma, but that's exactly what they did. They checked all the boxes and they said, we, we gave her time off. We did our job. We did what we were supposed to do, but there wasn't anything in place to say, hey, we need to check on her. And, you know, I even had, you know, uh, one of the um, senior NCOs who had responded to my house on that day. She's like, well, you know, you used to be such a good airman and now it just seems like you don't care anymore. And I, you know, I was super sarcastic at that time. I just didn't care. And I was like, well, yeah, why, would you, why do you think that is? And, uh, <laughs> you know, because I was so mad that people were missing this. And I remember um, a good friend of mine who was a senior NCO, he retired and he came back as a civilian and he said, you know, now that I'm out, I can, I can talk to you and tell you that in the meetings of what we were going to do, nobody knew what to do and nobody wanted to do the wrong thing. So they decided to do nothing. And I was like, oh, well, that's, that's good. That's a good choice. Um, and I think also, which you and I have talked about, is that the problem that I see, which is why I try to talk to military units specifically about this, is that what we tell people to do for suicide attempts and what we tell people to do in um, violence, interpersonal violence or domestic violence incidents are completely different. The reactions to these two are completely different, but we don't acknowledge that they often happen at the same time. And so, you know, when I say that my unit wasn't being malicious, they just didn't know what to do. Well, what do you do when your suicide, you know, um, protocol says stay with that person, make sure they're okay. But what if this person threatened you hours before and the protocol to that is to leave? So what do you, what do you tell them to do? Um, and I think that that is where um, they had never experienced that. And that is a side effect or a consequence rather of them not addressing domestic violence or interpersonal violence on the same level that they address sexual assault and to really understand that these two things happen simultaneously all the time. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> So I don't know what the response is. It's it's wild. It's so wild to me. And I guess um, I don't like. I was I was. I was <coughs> so I, I think in the beginning, you okay? <coughs> Swallowed down the wrong pipe. <laughs> <coughs> Continue. Yeah, we. So first you have to make a, a decision to actually do something. And this person told you that that, that wasn't the decision. We're, right. we, don't, we don't want to do something wrong. And so how do I ensure I don't do anything wrong by not doing anything? And I, I feel like, man, the, the number one thing that had to happen was <laughs> someone just had to let you know that they care and that they believe you. Okay. <clears throat> You yeah, can. it's 
it's so simple, right? <clears throat> it's so simple to say, I think a lot of times we, <clears throat> we think that we have to do this. We have to fix it. You know, we have to <clears throat> come up with this grand solution or so many times people will say, well, I didn't know what to do. And a lot of times you don't have to do anything. <laughs> you know, like you said, you just have to say, I believe you and I'm here and I care. And the rest will take care of itself, uh, you know, eventually. But people, especially in the aftermath, that's what they need to hear the most. Because especially when you're talking about interpersonal violence and like I was talking about the responses I got from people, uh, when gaslighting is involved, you're questioning yourself all the time. You know, am I making a big deal out of this? Did, you know, this this really happen the way I remember or anything like that? And so for somebody to sit down and say, I believe you and I care about what happens to you and I'm here if I need or if you need me, that's huge. And I think that people really underestimate the power of that. Yeah, really. <clears throat> You know, really, the the buzzword. <coughs> this will go away, I promise. Okay. Go ahead. <clears throat> go ahead. Well, the buzzword that we've heard a lot in the last couple of years is connection. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it started in, in 2019. I heard it most often with this. In the Air Force, we had the resilience tactical pause, mm -hmm. and it was all about connection, but it was a checklist on connection. And the more you follow the steps, the less authentic you are. And, and in your situation, no one was afraid to actually step away from the checklist. Like no one was right. People, well, people were afraid to step away from the checklist and just say, I, I care about you. And that goes back to what I was saying about, about children, right? Mm -hmm. I want you to feel safe and secure. Right. And one of the best ways to do that is a hug. Yeah. Like it's, it's, you know, it's, and that's where I think, you know, um, I would say it's really important to me because I, um, and I have, you know, made Facebook live videos about it myself in that, you know, people will do like their push-ups, right, for suicide awareness, or, you know, they'll post the suicide hotline number, or they'll say, hey, we have to believe, you know, um, we have to believe survivors and we have to believe victims. And the thing is that that doesn't always look pretty, right? Like right. it's not, I always tell people, it's not always like crying in the shower. <laughs> like it is anger, it's toxicity. It's, you know, it can be all of these things. It can be lying um, to others as far as mental illness. Um, and even with survivors um, of trauma and of sexual abuse, you know, trauma affects the mind. And so I think people, really don't understand how it's like, oh, well, they changed their story. Well, no, they're not changing their story so much as, as time goes further, um, what was happening in the moment and, you know, what you remember, how you remember it later can be very different because you're no longer in a trauma response per se. And <clears throat> I think that what we have to do is, you know, physically and virtually, like hug people, you know, and, yes. and it's like, <clears throat> go beyond <coughs> my Lord, <coughs> go beyond the hashtags. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Well, when we, if we can look at the hashtags <coughs> and, and realize that those are the minimum standards. Mm -hmm. Those are the minimum standards and so, like recognize when you need to do more. And the truth is the easiest way to recognize that is to build your relationships. Yes. The better I know you. So 
when I have a real relationship, I don't even need to ask you all these questions. I can tell by your body language that today right. hurts. Right. Yes. Yeah, it's really getting the relationship that lets you see somebody's um, nonverbal communication, right? And <clears throat> so I think one really important thing for me to realize as well in my own you know, how do I get here? How do I, <clears throat> how do I keep functioning is that I had to advocate for myself as much as I was advocating for everybody else. Um, because part of the reason that the things I do are for other people <clears throat> is because I've never wanted people to feel the way that I felt and to feel not believed, to have nobody there that says, I believe you, or I support you. And, and I also, um, I knew from a very, from very early on, you know, I was diagnosed with depression. I was diagnosed with anxiety. I was diagnosed with ADHD. I was diagnosed with <clears throat> all these things and it never felt right. And I had to keep advocating for myself. Um, and I finally found a therapist who listened to me. Um, and I was diagnosed uh, last year with borderline personality disorder, which is, you know, something that's incredibly taboo still. And I think that to me, it wasn't a diagnosis so much as like, um, somebody listened to me and it, it wasn't, you know, they knew, they listened when I said, I know myself. And all of these little things aren't explaining what's happening in my head. Um, but I also think that's important. It, it's important to know that because it was important for me to know the why of what was happening and what I did. But it's also extremely hard because, um, you know, I, I hear so many times people are like, oh, well, therapy didn't work for me. I had horrible therapists for a while. Um you know, ones that I actually um, reported to the board of that state. And, but it didn't mean that therapy didn't work for me. It meant that they didn't work for me. And right. I couldn't give up on that. And I couldn't give up on myself. And I realized that like, the turning point for me was when um, I, I, you know, I kind of realized like, okay, I'm in, like, say I'm walking down the street and there's a hole and I fall in this hole. Well, it's not my fault that the hole was there. <laughs> like, I didn't put it there, but I fell in it. <clears throat> and so I have to get myself out of it. Um, I can sit in this hole and think about how unfair it is that I'm in it and that I didn't put it here. Or I can say, well, this sucks, but now I have to get out of it. And, you know, that was kind of the turning point for me to say, okay, how do I get out of this? But also, you know, when you start to be this open person who's working on themselves, you have other people that reach out to you. And so it's like, well, how do I not, how do I make sure I don't crawl out of my hole and then crawl into somebody else's with them? <laughs> like, how yeah. do I stay out of my hole and help lift others out? And you know, one thing that I, I do tell people when they say like, well, what can I do or what should I do is <clears throat> it is important to tell people that you're there if they need you. But one of the things that people have to understand is that when somebody's in crisis, um, and I've used this metaphor before, if somebody is in the ocean drowning and you're standing on the shore, you can't just say, well, come to me and I'll help you. Just come here and I'll help you. Because they're spending all of their energy just trying to stay above water and, and trying not to drown. So you have to go out to them and, you know, we don't want you to go under with them. We don't want you to drown with them, but you need to take a life raft to them. You can't expect them to swim to you because if they could do that, they'd be on the shore with you. And so, like you said, hashtags are kind of the minimum. And then when it starts to look ugly and, you know, borderline personality disorder can look very ugly. And I think that there had to be, there had to come a time where um, I was brutally honest with other people, but also myself. And, you know, quite frankly, where I just got sick of my own shit and was just like, 
what do I do about it? Because I think what people don't understand is that speaking your truth and acknowledging your truth are two very different things. And I can say I have borderline personality disorder, or I can say that, you know, um, oh, well, I have depression or I have this or I have that. But if I don't really look and reflect on the darkest parts of me and who I was, I'm never going to fix that. Right. Because the diagnosis is the why, but it's not an excuse for the what, you know, it explains why you do the things you do, but you can't use it as an excuse um, to mistreat other people. And you also um, <clears throat> can't let others use it against you. Right. So there's so many times that, you know, when I've told people about this and been open with them about my mental health and I do something, it's like, oh, well, maybe that's because of her disorder or maybe it's she's being impulsive or maybe it's like, no, I mean, I, I've got it under control, <laughs> you know, um, and so they can gaslight you in that way, you know, and I think that a lot of us who've grown up with abuse and who've grown up with low self-worth um, and low self-esteem it's very easy to gaslight us as far as like, well, you're angry or you're mentally ill. So you're the problem, you know, or and somehow we deserve this or we bring this on ourselves. And one of the really important things for me was to realize that <clears throat> I could acknowledge my own toxic behavior and my own toxic way of thinking, but it never gave people the right to treat me the way they did. That was their own choices that they made. They had other choices they could have made and they chose to do the things they did. Um, and I think a lot of times it's really easy to blame ourselves or to let other people, to let other people blame us. But, um, you know, uh, like we said in the beginning, it, it's not your fault if you're, a, you know, if you're a victim. Um, but you also, it was also important for me to to not be a victim of myself either um, and to, to stop victimizing myself in the way that other people had um, previously. And I think that's just as important, if not more important. Yeah, definitely, because, you know, no one speaks to you more than you speak to yourself. Right. Absolutely. No one, no one will impact you or motivate you, discourage you or encourage you more than you do for yourself. And so when you talk about victimizing yourself, I agree that's that's important. And people definitely would be better off if they if they could recognize that they are doing that. But at some point in time, though, some point in time. Right. You said this was a turning point for you. And then you decided you decided that you're going to begin to love yourself and enjoy this life. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that journey. Let's talk about how you got mm -hmm. from all of that <clears throat> back to our first two minutes when you were, when we were talking about you jumping out of airplanes mm -hmm. and the smiling and the laughing. <laughs> how, how do we yeah. go from all of that to where you are now? Um, you know, I just, um, <sighs> I think it is just an ongoing process where I had always um, wanted to take care of other people. And uh, even when I was a kid, you know, if people were sick, if people were, you know, ill or whatever. I remember, you know, this um, <clears throat> one of the people that I used to go to church with saying, you know, hey, I remember when we asked the kids, we were in youth group, you know, like what it, what would you like to do? Or like, what superpower would you like to have or something? And he's like, everybody had these like kid marble superpowers, you know, he's like, and you said that you would like <clears throat> for people who are sick or people who are suffering, that you would like to take that for them. And he's like, you were so young when you said that. And I thought, what, what kind of experiences make a kid say that? Yeah. Um, and, and I think about that too. And I think that there came a point where I looked at all these things I was doing for other people and I will always do things for other people. But when I asked myself what I was doing for me, um, it was almost nothing. <laughs> and I had to say, you can advocate for all of these other people, but why, how are you advocating for yourself? Um, and I think that's where I really started to say, 
Um, what do you have to do? Whether it's therapy, whether it's, um, you know, uh, surrounding yourself with different people. And that was huge for me um, because I have, you know, the like extended family who's, oh, you know, you'll make it like, no, I won't make it. I don't want to make it. <laughs> you know, he's horrible to me. Why would I want to make it? Um, I cut off a lot of family um, because the thing is, even if people don't know that they're abusive or that they're manipulative doesn't mean that they're not. They're just not aware of it. And so, you know, surrounding myself with a huge support system who, who never, you know, um, they'll call me out on my shit for sure, but they don't question my experiences or the validity of the trauma I have had or the pain I've had. And, you know, we all have, um, kind of similar likes, dislikes. Um, no, not all my friends jump out of planes, you know, but there is a subgroup of them who do. And so it was really pushing myself um, outside of my comfort zone. And um, as I mentioned, like I am um, intensely afraid of heights. And so, you know, if you had told me when I started skydiving, which has been years ago now, maybe 2009, um, I would have said no way. And then, you know, I was like, well, I'll try anything once. And that was kind of the end of it. I tried it once and, you know, here I am. And I travel everywhere around the world and skydive with like these amazing people um, in amazing locations. And it was just really asking myself what I need to be happy, you know, and I do all these things to make other people happy. Um, but what do I need um, and how do I stop um, the behaviors that I have that are unhealthy and it, it doesn't happen overnight. You know, I still have really bad days, but, um, I am consistent in my habits as far as taking time out for self-care, whatever that means, um, you know, for other people, um, making sure that I'm consistent with therapy, making sure that I'm consistent with medication, um, and really just remembering to, to put myself in that list of things to do. Um, and knowing that a bad day isn't a setback, you know, you have to be as, as kind to yourself, um, and as graceful with yourself as you are with other people. So, um, it's, uh, it's definitely been, um, interesting and, you know, so many people, you know, when they hear my story are just like, oh, you know, you seem like this lifelong student and, you know, you just seem like you don't really know what you want to do. And I think, well, maybe not, but like, I have a pretty fun life. So, yeah. so I really don't care what you think. Like I can do whatever I want. Like me, my two dogs, I've got some snakes upstairs. Like they don't care what I do. So, um, yeah. And really just not, not thinking about others. Um, you know, I'm going to be 40 this year. I don't have kids. I'm not married and everybody's always going to have their judgments you know, um, but you really have to just do what makes you happy. And um, other people don't have to understand that. I love that. I love that so much. Do what makes you happy. Other people don't have to understand that. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what would you say to the person that 100% agrees with you? They want to do, the, they want to do the self-care. They want to be happy. They want to embark on journeys and adventures that can make them come alive, but they don't believe that they are worthy of that. What would you say to those people? <clears throat> oh, that is so hard. Um, you know, I know it's, it's super, um, it's super cliche and I try to, to stay away from it, but, um, I say fake it till you make it, you know, like I don't always believe that I'm worth the things that I have or do, or that I'm worth being happy. Um, or, you know, that I don't deserve to be happy after, you know, what I've experienced or the things I've done. But, um, I also start out small, you know, like I'm not going to change <clears throat> my entire life overnight. You know, if I want to, <clears throat> if I want to focus on school or language or jumping out of planes and, you know, my nutrition takes a back seat, that's fine. Like, I don't have to fix it all at once and get overwhelmed. But I say like, um, you know, start small, like, um, you know, had I never went on that, like one skydive, I would have never opened the door to all these other things, but it was like, okay, just take a chance and do it. 
you know, and, and see what happens, you know, either you hate it or you don't, or like go on a hike, you know, like you can go on a hike and become a park ranger or mountain climber, like who knows, you know, um, but just go somewhere. And I feel like I've also become really comfortable with being alone, um, which has taken years and years and years to do because I was not at all comfortable with it before. But it's really super great um, to be able to travel to these other places alone and just meet other people. Um, and, you know, I, one of the things that people always say is like, Brandy, you have friends in every country, like you have friends everywhere. And I'm like, because I just travel and meet other people. And then you build this network. Um, and it's really amazing. And you realize that no matter where you are, people have similar experiences. Um, and you really start to kind of get out of your bubble to see, like, I am not the only one. And it's really shown me like, yeah, I am worthy of being loved for who I am and being happy and being accepted for who I am and the way I am. And um, so it's it's made it a little easier when people do criticize you to say, well, yeah, for every, you know, one person that criticizes me, I have five who, who love me just fine. So, um, yeah, I just say you have to take that first step. And even on days that you don't feel like you deserve it, um, convince yourself, you know, you deserve it or pretend, you know, but do what you have to do until you find your, your tribe, until you find your people. I, I love that. I love it. When when you say fake it till you make it, I think about in this moment, I may not feel like, I may not believe that I deserve this, mm -hmm. but what if I did deserve it? What would I do? That's the fake yeah. it till you make it. Well, I would go ahead and take this trip. I would eat mm -hmm. this ice cream, go to the gym, get this workout, whatever it is. And yeah. And then what happens is you kind of get into this. Well, first of all, you recognize that you don't have to judge yourself. Did I deserve it or not? How about we just ask, did I have fun? Yeah. And, you know, and, and then you just build on top of that. Well, this sucks in my life and that sucks. And these people talk about me, whatever. But this was fun last Friday. I'm going to do it again. And like what you said, it's a process. And if the process yeah. takes years, you are worth the years that you put into it. Your happiness doesn't have an expiration date. It You're doesn't. Working. And I, you know, I look at it as um, so, you know, um, <clears throat> quickly, like the first, you know, I think about what if I had grown up with that support system, right? Like how would my life look and what would I be doing then and, and do that? And one of the things that got me interested in advocacy at 18 was when I was uh, working for Amnesty International. And this is a, a terrifying story with a, a relatively happy ending. But at the time, we um, were working with the International Criminal Court to... Um, it was one of the first times that um, a person, it was overseas in a different country, they were prosecuted for the, which which was a very long process to get them prosecuted for, at the time it was, um, they were a perpetrator of a rape on the youngest surviving rape victim in the world at that time, which was a one day old baby girl. And at 18, I couldn't even fathom that. I mean, it broke my heart. And I remember just sobbing uncontrollably um, and was like, from this day, I will be an advocate for the rest of my life. But as we have followed that young woman growing up, and she has had injuries that will be with her her whole life, handicaps that will be with her her whole life because of this. But she has literally grown up with an international community of supporters that believed her when she didn't even know what that was, um, who have rallied around her her entire life. And she is like this amazing young lady who is just so smart and so wonderful. And she started her life in the first 24 hours in the worst way possible. Um, but because she has this huge, huge, like, multi-country support of all of these people, men and women, who are like, we are not going to let you fail and you are worth everything in the world. Um, she has led a pretty amazing life. And I think of her often because I think like, 
that is what happens when you respond the right way. That is what happens when you just envelop somebody in support from the beginning. And so not only have I surrounded myself with people who can do that, but I have learned to do it for myself. Like you are worth every single thing that this world has to offer. Um, and that is very, very important. And I'm, you know, um, fortunate to have people like that. Um, but also, you know, I won't say I was fortunate to come across that at a young age, but i um, fortunate to have experiences with people um, who set me up to know um, how do I help other people not feel the way I do? And that has been integral to my healing as well. So how do you feel if I were to tell you that the trauma that you've experienced has had immeasurable impact on other people's happiness in a sense of you advocating for other people. Who, um, <clears throat> I think I'm still really bad hearing things like that, <laughs> with hearing things like that because I'm like, that's not true. Um, <laughs> Because it's right. It's like that logic versus emotional brain. We're like, I'm sure other people have um, been affected by me being there for them. But I think that, you know, there's still that part of you that doesn't let you believe that you've had like that much of an impact. It's like, well, I've had enough impact that I'll keep doing it. But like, meh. <laughs> You know, I I don't know. It's like Charleston just likes me. He's just saying stuff. But um, but no, like it's it's hard, right? And that's where um that is where those like insidious residual effects of trauma come in. You know, I can't understate how many people are like, oh well, it wasn't really abuse because he didn't touch me. And it's like, no, 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 man, abuse is insidious. Like it is, it can be so emotional and verbal, which to me, you know, my physical wounds have healed. It's the mental and emotional toll that is staying with me, you know, for a very long time. And so um, it's hard. It's hard to think that a lot of times, like, what, what am I doing this for? Like, nobody cares. Like, nobody wants to hear me talking. <laughs> Um, yeah, people keep asking. So I guess that's, I guess that's a good thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard. And so, you know, on the outside, I always say like, people are just like, oh, you have, you know, you have your shit together and like, you're so happy and you're helpful. I'm like, but you don't see the days that I don't get out of bed or I don't shower or I don't brush my teeth or I cry or I don't want to talk to anybody. Like you just don't see those days, but they're there. Um, but you just gotta, you know, you gotta take it for what it is and allow yourself to have bad days and then get up and keep going. Um, so yeah. Yeah, definitely. When, when I think about, when I think about all of that, right, there's, you know, the ups and downs and the healing process from trauma. And I bring it back to your impact on other people. What I think about is, you know, again, your impact is immeasurable. When someone experiences trauma, the number one factor in whether or not they develop PTSD or post-traumatic growth is social support. And Absolutely. for so many people, the, it's the aftermath of the trauma that puts them on a trajectory towards taking their own lives. Yes. And Absolutely. I, yes. <laughs> so you, you agree with me on that. Abs Absolutely. I, I think that I don't ever understate the trauma people experience ever, but the response they get afterwards is sometimes more traumatic um, and has such a bigger effect um, on them than the actual experience itself. So based on that, based on that, that we agree on that, how do you feel when I say that your advocacy has probably saved numerous people from taking their own lives. I mean, I agree with you unless it comes to me. <laughs> and then that can't possibly be true. Um, <laughs> obviously. Um, yeah. You know, it's, I think it's still hard. And I think what's hard about it is that um, trauma in some ways, depending, you know, on how it's happened or what's happened, the responses that I've always gotten have kind of, 
you know, either been explicitly said or, or implied, just be quiet. You know, nobody wants to hear you. Nobody wants to talk about yourself, you know, wants to hear you talk about yourself or what you've done, or you think you're better than everybody. And so you kind of internalize this and are just like, well, what I'm not, what I'm doing is, you know, not making that much of a difference. And so when people tell you those things, there's, you know, the part of you that believes it. Um, and then the part of you that's just like, Shh, that's not true. You know, um, don't, don't talk about that. Don't say that out loud. Um, and it's, and it's a struggle, you know, it, um, because I definitely have had people like, Hey, you know, reach out and thank me, um, and say, you know, this was really impactful or like, you really helped me through this time. And, um, and I'm like, okay, that's great. That's what, that's what keeps me going. But at the same time, it's like, Oh no, that's, that can't be true. You know, you forget it the next day. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand. I've been there. Um, and I'm just going to say that when you when you trust people and when you believe them and you believe they're coming to you with sincerity, then also believe them on the same degree when they're grateful for you. Yeah. They're, they're not making that's it up. The that's the struggle. I'm going to put it on my list of things to work on. <laughs> but that is that is the struggle, taking compliments. Like, oh, you know, I'm definitely every meme on the internet that shows somebody uncomfortable with taking compliments. <laughs> <laughs> like all of those memes were written for me. But I, I appreciate it. And I appreciate, you know, you um, taking the time to interview me on here and let me share my story and thoughts on things because, you um, that is the kind of thing that tells me like, yes, this is, um, this is worthwhile and it matters to people to hear. Um, and you know, anybody it helps, um, you know, is it works for me. And I'm always, as I tell people, I'm always open, um, to hitting me up on Facebook or anything, you know, I, I don't have to know people for them to reach out and just say, Hey, I'm having a hard time and I want to vent or I have some questions or anything. Well, I appreciate you being here. I mean, I've I've learned a lot from you, and I really appreciate you sharing your story. I know that there's so many people who have been through what you've been through, and a lot of times, I mean, you know, you feel mm -hmm. alone. Yeah, you feel, absolutely. You feel like you have nobody. For you to share your story is really an example of being courageous when it hurts, being courageous mm -hmm. when you're afraid. Um, so I appreciate you. And with that, you know, we, we've gone over an hour, an hour is oh, a yeah. but you, you bring so much, thank you know, you. I'll break a rule or two. I'm okay with that. <laughs> so. And thank you. Well, I'm going to blame it on the fact that I was dying for like a good 15 <laughs> minutes. So <laughs> I appreciate everybody who sat through my near death experience because <laughs> I don't know how to drink water. <laughs> so we're going to blame the extra like 13 minutes on that. Um, but yeah, and just these, these podcasts and these websites, like the website you have, um, it's important. Like those are all important to, you know, we have to show people as much as possible that um, they're not alone and that the journey, it's not perfect. You know, it's not like one day you figure it out. Um, I will probably go to therapy weekly for the foreseeable future, if not for the rest of my life to just stay even keeled, you know, and, um, and it takes work. It it takes work every day. And it's to me, it's like getting up and breathing or going to work. It is part of my life. Um, and it's something I, I do every day. And, you know, that's that's the only thing you can do. Well, I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful that you that you have that mindset to just keep on, keep on keeping on, keep on doing the work. You're worthy of the work. And so is everyone else who has watched this, who's heard your story who's been a part of your life somehow, worthy of the work to elevate your happiness and live your best life. So I appreciate Absolutely. you so much. And with that, we're going to end this broadcast on any last words you'd like to say. Um, I, I have to say like, just, yeah, the importance in my message is to not only be kind in how you respond to other people, um, but be kind in how you respond to yourself. Yes. Um, because talking to yourself is just as important. Um, I always, you know, think what I, what I say to a friend, what I'm saying to myself, and usually the answer is no. Um, so give yourself grace because there's, it is not a linear journey. Um, and none of us have it figured out. 
um, you know, do the best you can every single day. Um, and I will say that if you ever have the chance to jump out of an airplane, you really should do it. I have never seen one person unhappy by it yet. <laughs> so, you know, hit me up. I'll take you with me. It'll be great. <laughs> like, <Awesome>. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you. And with that, I will say bye and farewell to everyone. And I hope you all enjoy your day and weekend. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much.